new. Change is hard, and it can be all too easy to fall into old habits, routines, and thought patterns, preventing a game franchise, or even a person, from developing and growing into its full potential. Five years after Samus landed on Zebus and defeated Mother Brain, preventing the space pirates from duplicating and weaponizing the strange Metroid race, Samus is summoned to planet SR388 to wipe out the Metroids on their home planet. The parallels between the Metroid gaming franchise and the Alien movies continues. Some Similar to Ridley having to wipe out a hive of aliens and destroy the queen, Metroid 2 Return of Samus has the protagonist taking down the Metroid hive before the ultimate showdown with the queen herself. The plot is simple, but straight away the Metroid formula has changed. In the original game, the player knows their goal is to take down Mother Brain, but until they stumble upon a bridge, it isn't clear what must be done to actually complete the objective. Return of Samus removes the ambiguity altogether. The bottom right corner of the screen displays how many Many Metroids are left to destroy, making the objective clear, and cluing the player into their progress. Another streamlined approach is the overall map design. The Metroid planet SR388 is structured much different than Zebus, where Zebus was often a confusing labyrinth of long corridors and dead ends, SR388 feels more purposeful, with a linear path to the queen. That isn't to say Metroid 2 is devoid of exploration. Inside the underground structure are four different rune areas, where the natural dirt and stone gives way to brick and other unnatural materials. These four areas themselves offer a more classic Metroid experience, with branching paths and a less linear structure, but one cannot freely traverse the entirety of SR388 on their own volition, and instead are playing by the game designer's rules. This restriction is often pointed to as a weakness and proof Metroid 2 is inferior to its predecessor. However, I find this reasoning to be flawed and illogical. The quality of a game's design determines whether a non-linear adventure is superior to a linear one, and not the other way around. I also question if Metroid is as non-linear as often claimed. The only choice the player ultimately has is whether to defeat Ridley first or Kraid first. Outside of sequence breaks or other exploits, the path to the final showdown with Mother Brain is straightforward, and dare I say linear. The illusion of non-linearity comes from the confusing map design, rather than player freedom. Metroid 2 seems to embrace the idea of a path to the finish and removes the confusion part. They also managed to retain the idea of exploration, refining what made Metroid iconic and removing the fluff. But I'm getting ahead of myself. My biggest gripe with the original Metroid were how the enemy patterns didn't match the limited firing capabilities of Samus, and how the platforming didn't match the jumping characteristics of Samus. Metroid 2 addresses both of these issues, but uses different solutions for each. The combat is improved by expanding Samus's moveset. She can now shoot downward while jumping, and more importantly, she can crouch. The crouching is a simple addition, but makes all the difference in the world. She now feels like a versatile, badass bounty Bounty Hunter, with the ability to shoot enemies from multiple vantage points. It feels far less restrictive and makes for more engaging combat. The jumping, on the other hand, feels similar. While running, Samus performs a longer jump, and landing on small platforms can be tricky as the player can't really slow down mid-air momentum, only change directions. From a standstill, the player has control over inertia, making it easier to land on small platforms. What the developers did do is change the level design to match the capabilities of the protagonist. The first game often tasked the player with jumping onto small platforms and punished failure with a trip into lava to take damage. Metroid 2 does away with this, either increasing the platform's size when over lava or allowing the player to fall without taking damage when small platforms are presented. I love how both of the control issues were addressed in the sequel and I like how different approaches were used for each. The ability to crouch isn't the only new gameplay element though, and Planet SR388 contains even more Chozo statues offering Samus new abilities, like the Spider Ball, allowing the player to traverse up walls, the Spring Ball, allowing the Morph Ball to jump, and the Space Jump, allowing for infinite jumps when timed correctly. All of Samus' abilities from the first game return too, including the Bomb, High Jump Boots, and Screw Attack. Similar to the first game, where the bombs were needed to access Ridley's lair and the Ice Beam was sorted needed to access Kraid's Lair, the items in Metroid 2 are used as a form of progression gating. 
The player needs to explore to find the new abilities. Use the new abilities to reach new areas, which are key to making it to the end of the game. However, a second form of progression gating is also introduced. There are various pits of liquid, preventing progress. When a player clears all of the metroids in a given area, an earthquake occurs, draining the liquid, allowing access to the next area. In all, there are 10 earthquakes to trigger, breaking the game into different sections. Metroid 2 Return of Samus teaches the structure to the player right away. Traveling right leads to a dead end, so a player will naturally backtrack and choose a different path leading to a Metroid. Defeating the Metroid triggers the earthquake, and when the player travels back to the right, they'll notice they can now proceed. This leads the player to the first runes area. On the pause screen, the Metroid counter changes from a tally of total Metroids remaining to a counter for the specific area. In this case, there are four Metroids, but with the current item set, none are accessible. It is here where exploration again returns as one of the pillars of Metroid's design. The bomb is required to break walls, leading to three Metroids, but the journey is not complete. Further exploration is needed to find an item allowing access to the fourth one. The game nudges the player to keep exploring, and once the player finds the spider ball, they should be able to figure out how to utilize the item to reach new areas and ultimately make progress. Hitting roadblocks, making a mental note of the problem, and then returning upon a weapon or item upgrade is a hallmark of a Metroidvania title, rewarding the player for exploring and giving a sense of satisfaction when one figures out a puzzle or roadblock. The second rune area treats exploration completely different. A complaint I have with the original Metroid is how long winding corridors often contain the same two items, missile pods and energy tanks, over and over, or worse yet, a fake boss or nothing at all. This repetition made exploring a grind, as the reward for exploring yielded diminishing returns as the adventure unfolded. Metroid 2 is quite different. While energy tanks and missile pods are still plentiful, there is far more to uncover. First is of course the Metroids themselves, making each corridor feel meaningful to the mission at hand, and anticipation slowly builds as the player gets closer and closer to the last one. Second, there are optional upgrades in Metroid 2. The second runes area presents the Spring Ball, allowing Samus to jump in the Morph Ball form, as well as the high jump boots, increasing jump height. As best as I can tell, neither of these are required to beat the game, and are just niceties to make the game more convenient for those inclined to seek them out. Generally speaking, I've found the optional items to be a much more worthwhile reward for exploring long corridors than yet another missile pod or energy tank. Where Metroid felt like it was punishing the player for exploration, Metroid 2 feels like it is rewarding the player. In addition to making exploring more rewarding and engaging, the developers also address two more issues. First is the big energy ball. If a player touches one of these, their health will be completely restored. The missile battery does the same thing for missiles, restocking them to the player's maximum capacity. Both are shown to the player early on, letting them know of their existence and how they work. The placement of these is sometimes obvious, and other times less so, and the frequency of them decreases as the player marches on. Assuming Assuming a player has located them, the grinding from the first game is all but absent, a change I welcome immensely. Another major change are the save points. These are usually placed near the beginning of a new rune area, allowing the player to save their progress before venturing in. Thankfully, the player's health points are part of the save as well, meaning no more restarting at 30 hit points after death. Players can grab the big energy ball and missile battery and then touch a save point to make sure Samus is fully powered after a death. These inclusions are amazing and cut out a ton of unnecessary grinding. Finally, the second area also contains the Varia suit, reducing the damage Samus takes from enemies. I don't believe this is a required item either, but the utility offered is too good to pass up. While Metroid 2's second area was mostly about optional upgrades and reducing the Metroid count, the third area again features an item necessary for progression, the space jump. This acts like a double jump on steroids. Players will eventually come across spikes blocking paths when traveling vertically, signifying there is a different way up. The space jump would appear to be broken, but actually requires strict timing to use, balancing out its speed over the spider ball with the higher skill threshold needed for success. Once learned, it can be used to reach 
reach Metroids in the third rune area, but mastery of the space jump will also make later obstacles significantly faster. A wonderful trade-off. The fourth and final rune contains the screw attack, allowing Samus to damage enemies during a long jump. While not required to beat the game and isn't used for progression gating, it does act like a shield during Metroid fights, and I couldn't imagine beating the final boss without it. Even better, this incredibly useful power-up is supplied in the final quarter of the game, rather than the first. As seen below, there are just 8 Metroids out of 39 remaining when I grabbed it on this playthrough, meaning it couldn't be used to cheese through a majority of the game. It is a powerful item, so it is safe for last, again showing how much more thoughtful the designers were with item placement. With the four rune areas explored and all of the upgrades obtained, Metroid 2 is then a linear gauntlet through the final six Metroids and ultimately the Queen. My favorite part of Metroid 1 was the final gauntlet. It was a linear trek to the final boss with two of the toughest enemies in the game. It was the perfect buildup for the ultimate showdown and a real highlight. Metroid 2 thankfully replicates this. This final path is straightforward, contains the hardest Metroids in the game, does contain two checkpoints, but does not have any power-ups or health items whatsoever. It is difficult, and first-time players will likely have to backtrack to refill on health and missiles before continuing on, but it is absolutely possible for average skilled players to get through in a single go if they took the time to learn the enemy patterns and play proficiently, and I felt a great sense of satisfaction making it to the final area of the game without having to backtrack. It wasn't easy, but I accomplished it, and I appreciate the designers trusting they offered the player all of the items, power-ups, and teaching moments necessary to get through without aids. And of course, if a player can't do it, the option to reload on health and missiles is available, but at the cost of backtracking. The thing Metroid 2 gets the most right is the difficulty progression. The beginning of the adventure features easy enemies, weak Metroids, and runes are simple enough to navigate. As the quest unfolds, big energy balls and missile batteries are spaced out, increasing the chance of death. Enemies become more complex with armor reflecting the player's shots, and the Metroids are more evolved and far more challenging to take down. And then of course, the final gauntlet eliminates health and missile pickups entirely, truly testing the player's mettle. This difficulty progression makes Metroid 2 a far more engaging experience. The exploring is more worthwhile with the greater variety of power-ups and items, and the increasing difficulty means the player has to keep improving their skills if they want to proceed. The original Metroid has a massive difficulty plateau between the initial exploring and the final showdown, making it harder to stay invested with the gameplay. This plateau is absent in Metroid 2, and the map layout, item placement, and Metroid evolutions feel far more thoughtful. The next thing I enjoyed about Metroid 2 were the surprises. This game genuinely surprised me quite a few times, where the developers introduced something I didn't see coming. One of the Chozo statues appears benign, but an enemy jumps out. It isn't even obvious how to defeat it, as it seems immune to both the regular fire and missiles. The answer is, of course, bombs, something the player basically doesn't use offensively thanks to the crouching. It offers one of those aha moments. The muscle memory betrays the player, but if one stops and thinks for a moment, the solution becomes clear. In another area, there is no light at all, offering just black or green depending on how one indulges, and the player must again rely on critical thinking to get past the dark room and retrieve the treasure at the end. In this case, one must drop a bomb and then move left or right to see if they are actually moving. I love how the designers came up with new ways to use old skills to solve problems, and again, is something that kept me engaged through the runtime. The final surprise occurs at the end of the game. While the gauntlet to the final area contains no power-ups, the final area itself thankfully features an energy ball, missile battery, and the ice beam, in addition to a save point, assuring the player doesn't waste a lot of time when they inevitably die at the final boss. Again, thoughtful map design and item placement. Oh yeah, Metroid offers different weapons, and they are actually useful. The ice beam freezes enemies, the wave beam makes quick work of destructible blocks, the space 
laser offers a narrow wave blast but is more powerful. And lastly, the plasma beam offers an extremely focused beam but can defeat standard enemies in a single strike. I appreciate the thoughtful, balanced weapons. But back on topic, the boss isn't the surprise. During a scripted sequence, the Metroid counter increases from 1 to 9, meaning 8 new Metroids have hatched. These act just like the Metroids in the first game, meaning one has to freeze them with the ice beam, then hit them with 5 missiles. However, the programming is a lot tighter with far less slop, meaning I found myself getting latched onto, despite being familiar with their patterns. Assuming one hasn't seen a dozen Metroid video essays already spoiling this moment, I can imagine many players in 1991 were pleasantly surprised with this twist. This brings us to the final boss. There are two ways to beat this boss. First is to hit it with 150 missiles. Of course, I believe it is possible to reach this point without the prerequisite missile count, so the player will need to freeze it with a missile and then roll inside for yet another interesting use of bombs. And if the player runs out of missiles, there is an escape hatch out the bottom of the stage. This does reset the queen's hit points though. As a whole, the boss fight feels eh, sloppy. There are videos showing how to do it without taking damage, but it seems out of the realm of possibility for mortal players. Myself, I found a short screw attack through the projectiles and then inching forward a few steps before the bite attack would usually allow me enough attacks without receiving significant damage in return, but ultimately, it does feel crude. This leads to my biggest gripe with Metroid 2 Return of Samus. The Metroid fights are all disappointing and crude. Besides the original, there are four Metroid types, Alpha, Gamma, Zeta, and Omega. Each is more robust than the last, and each has more complex attack patterns and offensive capabilities. However, they all feel chaotic, and rarely did I ever feel like I was using skill or strategy to defeat them. Rather, it was a war of attrition. And when there are 38 to defeat, this rarely feels satisfying. I would stop short of calling them repetitive though, and this is because the environments in which they are presented is always changing, but the changing environments don't make them feel any less crude. Metroid 2's biggest setback is of course the lack of a map. Being a game based on exploration, it would be nice to see where one has been so one can plan where to go next. This was helpful in Zelda, and games like Link's Awakening are infinitely approved when the player is given a chance to see where they have not been. I would say most should be able to get much farther into Metroid 2 compared to the original without a map, thanks to a more linear approach and better design. One of the biggest pains in Metroid was randomly bombing walls for progression. The game was misleading, with some areas appearing to be bombable when they weren't, and bombable areas rarely featuring clues to their existence. Metroid 2 Return of Samus is superior, either using alternate tiles to hint at a possible progression point, or making it clear there is something on the other side worth exploring, again cluing the player into a potential breaking point. Offering clues and then rewarding the player for solving the mystery is a superior approach than throwing darts at the wall and hoping the solution reveals itself. Speaking of tiles, graphically, Metroid 2 is okay. The tile work is basic and it can be difficult to differentiate areas from each other thanks to the limited art direction. I am playing on a Super Game Boy with the default green, yellow, pink, and black color palette, which does help. Different areas feature more or less of these colors and it offers more visual variety than playing on a Game Boy player or via the eShop, but the artists didn't do as good a job with the color limitations of the Game Boy compared to other teams. Kirby's Dreamland does a masterful job with these limitations, alternating background colors to increase variety, and Link's Awakening drastically alters background tiles to give each area of Koholint Island its own feel. Metroid 2 still feels like a grid of tiles and never reaches the artistic excellence found in other games on the platform. That said, the designers did at least dabble with the backgrounds, rather than having it be a sea of a single color from beginning to end. Some areas do present some background detail, although not all. It is a step in the right direction, but there is little doubt the environments look dated. On the flip side, Samus looks amazing. She no longer looks like a xenomorph with an oversized head and goofy legs and stubby arms. Instead, Samus looks like a bounty hunter wrapped in futuristic armor. Her running animation is more normal. She even has a forward frame when changing directions, making the animation just a tad more smooth. I also like the sprites change depending on if Samus is facing left or right, meaning the arm cannon is on the correct side, whichever direction she faces. It is a wonderful touch and I dig how the artists paid attention to such minute details. 
Perhaps my favorite update in Metroid 2 is in the sound department. While the music of the original Metroid certainly has its fans, I rarely found it to be exceptional. It was neither atmospheric nor catchy, and to my ears, sounded average, failing to excel in any particular area. Even worse, the beeping when low on health was obnoxious. Many find the original does a superb job capturing the isolating feeling of being on an alien world where everything has it out for the hero. But I was rarely ever to find that atmosphere. Metroid 2, on the other hand, does a significantly better job. Upon leaving the ship, the player is treated to an upbeat tune. It is almost optimistic, like the player is about to embark on an epic journey and should be filled with excitement. But as soon as they enter the first rune area, the music stops. Occasionally, there will be some beeps, but nothing human. Other times, a brief jingle will play, but it isn't pleasant, but rather unsettling. But more often than not, there is no music at all. The only sounds heard are those of Samus's footsteps and shots from her arm cannon. These audio touches do a terrific job of giving the player a feeling of isolation. And I think the sound engineers did a fantastic job mixing silence and unsettling sounds to make the player feel like they are not welcome. That isn't to say there isn't awesome music though. The final moments of the game are drenched in ambience. At first haunting, before becoming menacing, perfectly capturing the tension the player will feel as they progress towards the final Metroid they work so hard to get to. Without a doubt, the best change was the chime playing when low on health. Rather than an obnoxious beep, it is a low rumble, almost mimicking a heartbeat. Twice during my recorded run, this rhythm taunted me, as I frantically tried to reach Neat Tank without taking damage. It is a wonderful feeling, and again, something the original game just doesn't capture. That feeling of helplessness, of being overmatched in a hostile world. Metroid 2 is obviously not perfect. The Metroid fights are lackluster, climbing with the spider ball is incredibly slow, the screen crunch is at times very real, and the background tiles are subpar. But overall, Metroid 2 Return of Samus is a dramatic improvement over the original. Rather than offering the illusion of nonlinearity with a dubious map, Metroid 2 streamlines the structure into something more thoughtful. Progression makes more sense, exploration offers better rewards, the game actually saves health instead of restarting at 30. The player can seek out big energy balls and missile batteries to replenish resources rather than grind. Bombable walls come with clues, the alternate weapons are useful, long corridors don't waste the player's time, and the runes frequently loop, reducing backtracking. I'm impressed the developers were not afraid to change things, especially when the original title was held in such high regard. Instead of hiding linearity behind a confusing map, the developers embraced it with a clear path to the end and logical progression gating. Rather than fill the game with music, the developers weren't afraid to just let the silence linger. Instead of filling each screen with an onslaught of enemies, the developers occasionally just let SR388 be barren, letting the player feel alone. There isn't a time chase up to Samus's ship, instead replaced with something completely different. When I play Metroid 2 Return of Samus, I'm thankful the developers were not afraid to, well, be new.